so welcome back everybody um hope you uh, got what you needed during that during the break um now we're going to deal with questions for our speakers so far today so if i could uh if i i could ask uh you all um richard vishal ben um to rejoin me um put your videos on if you can or if bandwidth supports and uh, added to that list as i said just before the break um, it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague, Sonia Gonzalez, who's the uh, Togo Standard Product Manager for the Open Group, known to many of you um, previously for her work in the Arch uh, Architecture and Archimate forums inside the Open Group and uh, 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 a long career as an enterprise, enterprise architect herself in various industries. So uh, welcome, Sonia. Um, we have a great panel and uh, we have a lot of questions, so um, please um, uh, do your best to answer them, but uh, be as succinct as you can. I'm going to try and get through as many as possible and uh, the ones we don't get to, um, then uh, I will, um, uh, we will, we will do our best to answer them uh, remotely. So first off, without any further ado, um, question. Um, how does the TOGAF standard work with SAFE? Uh, Richard, you touched on this in your presentation specifically, and it's right. a question that we get asked a lot. Yeah, so you want me to be succinct about this one? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, prepared for a 20 minute conversation here. Right, so it, it actually can work very well there. Uh, specifically, um, if you know SAFE, it works on the concept of, uh, the, we have what we call program increments. Right, and so about after every 10 weeks, you basically you do is you uh, you define your architecture, uh, you you create your vision in the in the program, you do your estimates, you create your backlog, and then you do your spurts, right? Um, and every 10 weeks, you do another program increment. Well, that fits very well with TOGAF, where we use TOGAF very much in the um, we to help define us what we're going to be doing during the program increments, right? The the vision. We're trying to do the architecture. Now, what the very key thing is that we also use the other phases during the actual sprints. The architecture works with, during the implementation side, we work together with the implementers, with the other developers. Sorry, we are part of the team um, and we help. So we, we create what we call our intentional architecture in the beginning. And as through the various sprints, we our architecture evolves as we start to learn things because in the beginning we really don't know what the heck we're doing. So um, as we start learning information, as we start accumulating it, and we work together, uh, we we have an emergent architecture starts to evolve. Okay, that that's as succinct as it's going to get with that kind of question. Right. Um, yeah. Does anyone any anyone else want to to add to to that? Yes, actually, uh, Steve, hi everyone. Yeah. I would like to add that uh, besides the, the, the briefing that Richard just gave. Uh, also, so you've recognized the new having enterprise architect at the higher level, at the lean portfolio management level. So you will see in there like enterprise architect is key for the strategic planning, the epics, the strategic teams, and having the portfolio vision in which architect is paramount. And also architecture, it's very important to define the different epics and guardrails that will uh, at the end, be helpful to govern the rest of of the developments. Whenever you would you reach the the level of the uh, delivering a pipeline and the and the agile release train, having this uh, uh, guidance from architecture, it's quite important. And, and safe recognize that in the framework. So that's the way that they can be used together as well. Right, right. And it flashed up on my screen quickly, but I didn't get a chance to use it. But I know Chris Frost has put a comment in the chat around uh, around that too. So. Um, do look in there. We we will move on. Um, in terms of Agile and its relation to the TOGA standard, do you feel one always dictates the other or are, or does it depend on the scenario? Um, and should one dictate the other? So can I answer that one? Yeah. Probably. There is no standard for Agile. Hmm. All right. So TOGA, TOGA is a framework. Agile is a process because there are there are very there are a lot of different frameworks or for agile it's it's kind of a a broad statement right so uh yes it's definitely uh works so works with toga 
Uh, Telegraph, remember, is focusing more on strategic. It's the enterprise architecture side that we, we do there. A lot of times when we look at the agile side is from the development side. So it's a layer within the Telegraph. It's, it's enabling how does the architects, the enterprise architecture work with developers and solution architects together. So it's a combination of the both. I wanted to stress that because we say agile, it's just a, it's just a broad statement. Yes, I will add to that that also, you know, we have able to say that EA has a practice and the top of standard are meant to be adapted to the specific needs and the culture. And at the end, agile is much more than just development. It's a way of working, being an agile enterprise. So I think it's it's bigger than just the development, even though it's it's key and important in that side. So it's not that one mandates the other. It's the fact that your practice and not only enterprise architecture, every practice that you have in your organization should be adapted to this new agile way of working in general. Right, and I think it's an important point, Sonia, because it's it, you know I often I often trip over the, the the difference between agile software development methods and uh, agile enterprises, and they're you know they're really really quite quite different. Um, but that's uh, that's good. We'll we'll move on. Steve, um, Steve, Steve, I would like to say something oh, to this. Please do, Ben. Yes. Uh, we in Shell uh, we see we we basically use Scrum. So there is a standard because uh, the various ceremonies are standardized, the process is much standardized, the tools are uh, becoming more standardized. Uh, so uh, we work in sprints, etc. <clears throat> so it, it is not that that basically agile is, 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 is not an organized process. It is the, the question you have to ask yourself is if agile is about developing functionality in projects, is it really interfering that much with the creation of architecture? Because let me say 95% of the IT that gets developed at Shell can be developed inside the ring fences of the existing architecture. The right. technology gets basically a revamped every two years because a lot of technology is coming out, especially in cloud. So you need to keep current, otherwise you're dropping behind and people don't know anymore what you're talking about because everybody has moved on. Right. However, when it turns out that you really need a new piece of architecture that, did not, that, that doesn't exist, so you cannot just bring it into the Agile team. I, I, I went through this because we had a SQL Server database that was running on the largest node that was in existence. So and we still needed to scale by a factor of 10. So we needed a different technology, a database that scans horizontally, basically that you can have over multiple nodes, which doesn't work with SQL Server. And that's why we had to move to NoSQL to, to MongoDB. So in an agile way uh, with, uh, with sprints, we developed in collaboration with the vendor of MongoDB, we, we, we fleshed out what um, the specific MongoDB uh, layout had to look like, and we were talking about 50 servers, uh, MongoDB living on 50 servers. So that this, this is a piece of architecture. And uh, so there was agile architecture development in this project, but that is rare. That is not the normal case. Architecture is about non-functionals and uh, agile teams, 95% of the time are are interested in creating the functionality that the business needs, and they care a little bit less about the architecture that they have to work in. They are coding, they are testing, they are running, they are deploying, they have tools for that. Architecture, it just needs to be there, and uh, they they won't go into discussion as long as it's performant enough and, and scalable. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to uh, next question. Maybe one for you, Vishal. Um, uh, in fact, specifically for you, this one. Um, could you provide more clarity on your mention of um, value streams being mapped to capabilities? So, um, can you give an example of um, of how that happens or how that's done? Sure. So uh, there are two series guide already from TOGAF, uh, from the open group, one on value streams, on one on business capability with examples. I would like to reiterate one of the, my favorite example, which is there. 
So let's assume uh, a hiring process wherein there are certain process involved, which are known as value stages. For example, advertising the job specifications, then assessing and inviting the application, then conducting the interviews, and finally, you know, select, selecting and the agreements and everything happening. So these are, let's say, the four stages involved in a, in a hiring process, which is known as value streams. Business capability for each of these value streams are then noted down. For example, when it's advertising, it's more um, the, the business capability is around how the enterprise is advertising, how effective it is when it comes to hiring. It's it's more about the hiring and the interview process, the HR management business capability. When it comes to agreement and everything, there is a finance capability coming into the picture. So that's how the capabilities are mapped to each of these value streams. And then when we have this clear picture across the process with the value stages and the capabilities, we assess how which business capability is performing how you know how good it is and where is the lagging areas and once we have identified those lagging areas and and we can always present it in a dashboard of a heat map kind of structure that these are in red which means these are the areas where a candidate is suffering uh, or or is not liking the process and once we strengthen those areas probably our value streams are you know all green and self sufficient and and it's giving a good experience to the end user, which is the candidate in this case. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question here, maybe maybe one for you, Sonia. Um, probably in the best position to answer this. Is there a collaborate? <laughs> put my teeth in. Is there a collaboration or relationship to between the TOGAF standard and the Open Architecture standard from the Open Group? Yes, actually, it was especially at the beginning, since when the OAA was released and we were in the process into the into the open group of releasing it into the market. It was participation from the Architect2 Forum, and mostly has experts, and it has been also discussion in the TOGAF and IELTS working group that Richard mentioned, and also when Chris Frost was previously leading the effort. And therefore, we recognize that more needs to be done. We need to work more because the both of them work nicely together. So the, the next step we should take is to provide more guidance on the how. And, and actually, perhaps at the end of the panel, we can take a couple of minutes to go over the results of the polls, which are interesting because they reflect in a way that people need more guidance on the how. So, right. so that's uh, the response is that, yes, it was some work in the past, and we are looking forward to engage more with that working group. Yes. Okay, thank you. Talking of guidance, the next question. Um, uh, how uh, any guidance that you can give on keeping the documentation documentation aspect up to date, um, so it doesn't get in the way of project delivery. And let me couple this. Let me couple this with a with a more general uh, question. I guess not specific to documentation, but have you ever had feedback from agile teams that the architecture processes slow things down? And if so, how do you deal with that? One, one specific okay. on documentation and, and one generally on uh, agile teams, maybe thinking that architecture processes slow things down. Any uh, any volunteers for that one? Uh, yeah, I can handle both of them. Right. Okay. So one of the key things is um, that we've, when we do our project is that the architects are components of the team, right? They're part of the scrim team. They are not, uh, they, Everybody has a voice in the team there. So uh, even the, the lead developer works with uh, the architects in helping to find the architects. Um, documentation is a challenge, no matter whether it's from the development side or it's from the architecture side. It tends to we put a focus a lot in the beginning, but when things start to go into panic mode, uh, people get sloppy. They, they, you know, we're working late, large, late nights and everything. And there's a lot of changes doing being done, and those are not always captured. The only way that we can do things is we try to automate as much as possible the capturing of the information, keep it as lean as possible. We use a lot of wikis um, to to capture the information at the same time. Right? Um, we're not, and because we we get away from this gated process, there, uh, it's it's not 
Uh, you don't spend all the time making fancy PowerPoints. You're trying to really just capture this information and, and trying again to capture the data. That's another thing I wanted to focus on, which uh, hopefully we will take a look at in enterprise architecture. There's now been a movement of automated tools to help capture information to uh, even automatically generate models um, of the initial systems there. So automation, same thing that happened for DevOps has to happen for enterprise architecture. Right. Okay. Point thank you. Like to add Steve yes, uh, over here. So uh, thanks Richard for bringing out the automation perspective because uh, there are lots of auxiliary documents also needs to be prepared like weekly status report and monthly status report. How the Enter, uh, how how the work is going on for that rather than putting a entire document it's always better to have some of the tools which are available open source tools because it's more like drag and drop and then a snippet of that automated tool always works and it saves lots of time in those auxiliary documentation but in, in reality one of the major one thing I just want to discuss about that one of the major challenges at the end of the project, you need to do a cleanup of the things because you just you got to look at reality, man. You just have when projects start to, to basically um, you start finding all the things you miss. You go into the testing issues, performance issues there. You're so overwhelmed. You're actually doing, you know, 80 percent of the work in the last 20 percent of the time. You need to have some time to uh, fix up the documentation. Right, there's it, you just have to live in the real world. The problem, though, is by the time it comes there, they've reallocated you to another project. Right, <laughs> so <laughs> you don't get that time. So yes, that's an open source point that there is no magical answer. To, Richard, if know. I can ask you a question, hmm? um, we, we see the same uh, pattern. Uh, however, the documentation of systems that are created in an agile way. Uh, deal with the architecture of the application, which is basically software uh, engineering, uh, which often fails in in inadequate documentation and people uh, yelling uh, the soft uh, the, the code is the documentation. That that is not so much at Shell what we are concerned with when we talk about uh, the, the solution architecture. We are much more concerned with the architecture between systems. Uh, what uh, interfaces exist to other systems? Uh, how what technologies do the do uh, they use? And uh, this is uh, pretty rigorous at Shell. You don't get to go live when at, uh, uh, when basically the inter system architecture is not bolted down because otherwise you jeopardize the whole operation if you have a rogue application. So I totally recognize what you say at the level of software engineering and software architecture, but I do not recognize it in our practice as far as architects work. I do. I am very happy with the fact that you have embedded architects. That is that is essential. Well, that's interesting. I, uh, I don't want to, but I just finished a major project with the pipeline, right? Where we had the interfaces well defined, but then they changed the controllers at the last minute with new software. Right, so <laughs> let me tell you about the resource industry. Yeah, you know, you always get surprises. Okay, uh, yeah, we need I, to. I hear uh, what you say. We we yeah. we need to move on. Interesting, uh, interesting perspectives there. So, would your approach? Uh, what would your approach look like, or would it change if a part of the business architecture needed to be developed along the way too? What's the yeah, you know, what's the what's the role or what's the approach for uh, where you need to develop the business architecture too? Uh, okay, all I can do from my own experience is that the business architecture always evolves because we first we have the the first we determine what is the target architecture, and then uh, we we create the backlog, right? And so we have the business process and the value chain, and then that maps the development chain. Then we start doing our sprints and we find all the things we were wrong mm -hmm. and all the assumptions. So the business process has to be re-evolved again, right? And then we also have to try to, let's say I did a QDC type of thing there. Well, guess what? We get the feedback from the product managers who don't necessarily always get it from the field, 
and put it out to the field, the guys say, uh, uh you don't really remember that this really changed or this isn't working or I'm not comfortable with this because I've been used to this thing for the last 20 years. Right? So there's always this input that evolves. So yes, the business architecture continues to evolve and drives then the development solution. Okay. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to hear the survey results from, uh, from Sonia. Um, and uh, apologies if I, if I didn't quite get to your question. Um, it regards the decision around the technology stack. Who decides on the technology stack in your experience or who should, or who do you think should decide on the technology stack? I, I, I mentioned uh, the technology stack. Yeah. And uh, to a large extent, this is the decision of the solution architect. Um, of course, uh, you need to uh, <clears throat> you need to choose a technology stack that is supported by the IT organization, uh, obviously. But basically, it is one of the pivotal uh, decisions, and it is taken at a moment that the team hasn't been convened yet. Now there is a lot of uh, peer review happening at Shell, and you need to defend your choice for the development stack because it determines so much um, even in sometimes you can you can be in a situation that is very hard to get uh, um, adequately uh, trained java programmers and you you are forced to try and develop this uh, in uh, c sharp uh, and basically uh, .NET. Uh, that can even happen but that is rare <clears throat> so most of the time it's a decision are we in a uh, um, are we in a buy or uh, or make scenario? So you get uh, SAP consultants uh, when it's an SAP uh, project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, in, you you can you can actually get even into a discussion on architecture. Are we going to have an uh, event uh, uh, an event centric um, uh, ar uh, uh, software architecture? That will lead to having different people on board than a more uh, relational database centric uh, uh, development. No, I agree, but the one thing you should realize again, a little bit of practicality for large projects too, it can be very political. Right? There have been many times that, for instance, a CIO has been uh, signed this big deal with Oracle. Right? So he's defined, you have to use these Oracle products. Same thing with IBM too. You have to use the entire IBM suite. It may not be the best fit for the particular solution, but very often or sometimes, unfortunately, uh, you either inherited some type of uh, decisions. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, constraints that we uh, that we have to deal with along the way, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you all um, panelists. Before before you leave us, um, Sonia, you'd like to uh, share the survey results, I think. Oh, yes, actually, I don't know if it would be possible to put them on the on the screen so everybody can see them. If not, I will I will read it. So because I have it in, in there, I think it's quite a set of interesting responses for the first one is the talk of standard really Ready aim to support the digital enterprise. Uh, I think we got uh, around 28% of people saying that it actually it, it, it supports the digital enterprise, and we have 33 saying that it doesn't. But we have 40% of people that didn't deliver an answer, which is it right. give us an idea that we need to work more and give it that guidance, which is precisely another of the working efforts that are around into the architect to forum. You know, there's a lot of discussion about what digital enterprise is and what is a digital yeah. transformation. If you yeah. ask that question, you will receive probably 20 different answers. So therefore that will motivate us more to work more in that space. And uh, in the other one, which is also connected with this, which is also around EA, TOGOF and digital, uh, the questions were if EA is uh, key or crucial for digital transformation and also the total standard is also important and it could be adapted to support the digital enterprise. Again, we receive around uh, 15 or 20 percent people saying, uh, sending individual responses and 30, 34 saying that all of the above. So they saying that EA is important and also talk of standard is important and yeah. is the talk of standard can be applied to do that. But again, similar trend, we have around 
49% of people that didn't respond to the poll. So again, that is like in a way related with the previous response. People is not quite certain about what to do with digital transformation. So therefore, there's a lot of room for us to deliver value into the market in this space. And finally, about the agile question, also interesting responses. EA key to support agile developments. Uh, we received 13% of responses. Uh, EA can be delivered in an agile way, more people, 33%. 21 important for enterprise agility, which is interesting, like supporting the fact that we say before that EA should be used for the agile enterprise and adapted to the digital enterprise. Then in relation with the talk of standard adapted to support agile delivery and adapted to support agile developments around 20% each of the three responses and 34 people saying that all of the above applies to that. And again, similar trends around 40% of the people that didn't deliver an answer. Uh, so we hope that after this virtual event, people is more clear now after the excellent uh, um, presentation that we have saw before from, from Richard Bishel and, and Ben about Agile and EA and TOGAF. But again, I think this is uh, something that we should call our attention and the need to deliver more guidance into the market in this aspect. Yeah. So interesting responses. Thank you for taking the survey. Yes, thanks everyone for your for your input on that, and it, it does help guide what what we do um, inside the open group and uh, and where we take things. So we'll we'll move on. Thank you again, uh, Richard, Ben, Vishal, and Sonia for your uh, for your thoughts and um, uh, a warm virtual round of applause from uh, from the attendees for you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.